Okay, so using the layout that we're using, it's Perik Hay, chapter 5, Mishnah 22. Who Hayo Oimer? He used to say. The question is, who used to say? And there are different opinions. That's why you'll see that there are different layouts of where this Mishnah belongs. Because there are different opinions about who it was who said this particular Mishnah. One view is that it does continue as we're doing from Ben Bagbag and Ben Heihe. So that's actually the author of this particular Mishnah. But there is another view that it is completely unrelated. And this Mishnah is attributed to somebody called Shmuel HaKatan. Okay, which is interesting because we haven't seen Shmuel HaKatan in, in any of the Mishnahs in this, in this chapter. So that's interesting. This is the Mishnah about milestones in life. Okay, Ben Chameshanim, right? Ben Chameshanim Lemikra, this goes through all the, the milestones in life. And so what we have to do over here is we have to work out how do we know? How do we know that these are the milestones? And then we have to work out what is it teaching us? So for example, when it tells us what age <coughs> you're supposed to learn, we understand the lesson, right? At five years old, you start to educate a child. That's, that's obvious. But when, for example, it comes to the point and it tells us that 70 years old is old age, <laughs> what's the lesson in that? Okay, so that's what we've got to work out. So let's see. Let's run through them all first and then try and unpack them, bearing in mind that this is Pirkei Avos. Pirkei Avos is not Halacha. Pirkei Avos is Lifnim Yishur Sadin, Mili Dechasidusa. It's the things that are beyond the requirement of the law. So we also have to keep that in mind as we go through these various milestones. So let's start at the beginning. So who are your Omer used to say, Ben Chameishonim Lemikra, at five years old, you start, <coughs> what's, how do you translate this? Lemikra. You start to approach the scriptures. Now it is interesting because he could have said the other way around. He could have said, Le Mikra, when is it time to start learning the scriptures? Ben Chameshonim at five years old. It's not how this mission is presented. It says, Ben Chameshonim at five years old, Le Mikra, that's when you start moving towards learning the Tanakh. Okay, interesting way that it's framed. And of course, the implication over here is that he's telling us that at the age of five, a person is supposed to move in a particular direction to familiar themselves, familiarize themselves with the, with the part of Torah that is Mikra, rather than saying that Mikra is something you, so to speak, master at five years old. That's obviously not possible. It means you start, you start the process of learning Tanakh at five years old. <coughs> okay? Ben Eser Shanim Le, what do you do at ten years old? Le Mishnah. That's when you start studying Mishnah. Okay? At 10 years old, you start to study Mishnah. Ben Chamesh Esrei at 15 years old, what do you start? What do you start? The Gemara, right? That's when you start Gemara. Now, bear in mind that this is a Mishnah that's talking. So the Mishnah happened before the Gemara. How could the Mishnah be telling us that at 15 years old, you're supposed to learn Gemara? There is no Gemara when this is written. The Gemara is only going to happen later, right? The Gemara is an expansion of the, of the principles that are taught in the Mishnah. So that's a bit odd. How's the Mishnah telling us that we should be learning Gemara? Okay, good question. Let's hold that thought. So the first three that we're seeing are all specifically about learning. This is like the Chinuch time frame. You start educating your child at five with the Chumash or the Tanakh at 10 with the Mishnah, at 15 with Gemara. So the first thing is that this is education. The second thing we have to notice is here we're going in five-year gaps, whereas the rest of the Mishnah will move in decade gaps. So that's also interesting. Next, Ben Esrim. What happens at 20 years old? What does it say? Oh, sorry, Ben, sorry, ben Shimon Esrei. Sorry, at 18 years old is Le Chupa. At 18 years old, you get married. That's also interesting because that doesn't fit either the five or the 10 year gaps. So that's also an interesting one. And how do we know that 18 is the age of marriage? Where do we learn, <coughs> Where do we learn that from? Okay, so Ben Shimon Esrei Le Chupa, at 18, you're supposed to get married. Then Ben Esrim, when you get to 20 years old, what does it say? Ben, ben Esrim. Lirdoif. What does that mean? Lirdoif. What does it mean? To pursue. Now it's not clear over here 
if the person who's 20 has to pursue or if we pursue people who are 20. <laughs> it's not clear. It just says Lira Doif that that's when you're supposed to pursue, but it's not clear who's pursuing who. Okay? That's at 20. Ben Shloishim at 30, it says Le Koyach. 30 is the age of strength, which basically means in Judaism, after 30, you're pretty much over the hill. That's what it seems like, right? Because Shloishim Le Koyach, 30 is the age of strength. So the implication is that after 30, the strength possibly declines. That, that's what it would seem. Okay? Ben Arboim, when you are 40 years old, what happens at 40 years old? Le Bina. That's when a person reaches an age of insight, an age of understanding. Okay? The question now is, so what does that mean? What does it mean practically? What do I have to know if 30 is the age of strength? What do I have to know if 40 is the age of understanding? What's the practicality of it? Okay? Ben Chamishim, when a person is 50, so 50 is Le Eitzah. That's when a person is in a position that now they can share wisdom. They can share wisdom with other people. They can give counsel. That's actually what Eitzah means. They can give counsel. So what does that mean? When you turn 50, you should start interfering in everybody else's business because it says that you can give counsel. So that's it. You've got permission. Age of 30, start interfering. <coughs> ben Shishim, 60 is the age of... Of what? Le Zikna is the age of, so I heard a nice word for it, nice word, sagacity. <laughs> right? How you get from Zikna to sagacity, okay, we've got to work that out. But you want to hear the good news? I'll tell you, I'll tell you the good news. The good news is that the Arizal is of the view that Chamish in the age of 50 is already Zikna. It's already old age. Not surprising considering how young the Arizal was when he passed away. He didn't live to 40. So he said that 50 was already considered old age. That's an interesting principle. Okay, so 60 is considered old age. If 60 is old age, what is 70? Ben Shivim Le. How do you translate Seva? What's Seva? Seva is ripe old age. That's how they usually translate it, right? Ripe old age is 70. Okay, so you have old age at 60 and you have ripe old age at 70. Okay, Ben Shmoinim Le Gvura. Shmoinim 80 is the age of power, of strength. Now we already said Koyach before at the age of 30. So that implies that Koyach and Gvura are two different things, right? So Koyach is obviously physical strength and Gvura implies some kind of resilience or some kind of power to be able to push through difficulties and obstacles. If a person makes it to 80, that implies that they've pushed through some of the major challenges of life. So up until that point in time, it seems very nice. Everything is very encouraging. If you make it to 80, Kanainora, Gvura, that is strength. Not sure after reading the next two if a person's going to be that excited on their 90th birthday. So what does he say, Ben Tishim, when a person is 90 years old? What does it say? Loshuach. That's when a person becomes stooped. And what's the lesson in that? The person becomes bent over. This is supposed to be teaching us, not just making comments about the regression that a person experiences in old age. What does it mean? Lo shuach, that a person becomes bent over. And then the best of the lot, obviously, is Ben Mayo, when a person is 100 years old. Can you imagine putting this on the birthday card for somebody who's 100 years old? <laughs> what does the birthday card say? Ki'ilu <laughs> meis. It's as good as the person has already died. Va'ovar u'botel min ha'olam. And I think it's where Ava Bottle comes from, by the way. It's from the, I'm serious. Ovar u'botel. That's where it comes from. Ovar u'botel. That's where it comes from. As if the person has already moved away and has become void in this world. Ovar u'botel. That's where Ava Bottle comes from. I'm, I'm not joking. This is where the expression comes from. So please God, we should make it to 100 before we become Ava Bottle. That's what it seems. Now it is interesting also that the Mishnah stops at this point at 100 years old because if we're going to say the Tehillim tells us that the average human lifespan is 70 years and it should have gone to 70. But if we're pushing past 70 you would have expected it to go to they would have gone to the full lifespan of a human being which is 120. So it is interesting that we stop at 100. It's an interesting concept, right? So there are quite a number of things that we have to try and understand over here. <coughs> What's the lesson? How do we get to these particular milestones? And why are certain of them 
portrayed in the way that they are because they do seem to be a little bit odd. So let's go right back to the beginning. Ben Chameshonim Mikra at five years old is when a person starts to learn. Mikra starts to learn the scriptures. I'll tell you an interesting thing. If you have a look in the Gemara and you then see how it is quoted in Shulchan Aruch in the laws of Talmud Torah about how a person is supposed to conduct themselves with Torah learning, which includes the laws of how you educate a child, guess what it says? What is the age of the beginning of education according to Halacha? Anybody know? Is six years old. The age of formal education brought, brought both in the Gemara and in Halacha is six years old. In fact, it even uses the expression that at six years old, you should stuff a child with knowledge like you force feed an animal. It's a very interesting comparison, but you should really stuff them full of knowledge from the age of six. Why then over here does he say from the age of five? Because this is Mili de Chasidusa. Because this is Pirkei Avos. Pirkei Avos is not the letter of the law. Pirkei Avos is how you're supposed to behave beyond the requirement of the law. And therefore it says start earlier. Don't wait until the child is six. Start to introduce the child to Mikra, to reading scripture from the age of five. Now let me ask you a simple practical question. Mikra in those days was the only part of the Torah that was available in text. Right? Only the scripture was scripture. This is the first time now in history that they're starting to record other information in the Mishnah. <coughs> if at five years old, the child is supposed to engage with Mikra, with actually reading the Chumash and the Nach, what do you think we do until the age of five? <coughs> what do we do? Torah Shaval Peh. Okay, that's maybe a little bit more advanced. <laughs> So what else? What other practical things would you suggest that we do if at five years old they're supposed to read Tanakh? Okay, brochus is not education of Torah. It's education of Jewish conduct, right? So the question is, what do you do in terms of education of Torah learning up until the age of five? So the answer is, teach them to read. Because Le Mikra, again, that's the language of here. Le Mikra at five years old, they should be in a position where they could read. Le Mikra, where they're actually capable of reading the Tanakh independently. So therefore the implication is that up until the age of five is when we're supposed to be teaching children how to read so that at the age of five, they can already read the Tanakh, which is a little different to how we do it in our schools, right? By the age of five, we're starting to teach them to read so that when they get to the first grade in, 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 at the age of six or possibly even the age of seven, you know, that's when they're starting to put words together. According to the mission in Prika Avos, we're supposed to have them literate, they should have literacy already before they get to the age of five. How's that for a thought? Right, that, that's, that's how it should be, right? That's how it should be. Okay, so how do we get to know that five is the number? So the Baratunura says something really interesting. We know, Ki ha'adam We know that a person is compared to a tree in the field and specifically to a fruit tree. That's the, the Pasuk in Prasha Shoftim tells us that that's how you're supposed to look at a Jewish person. It starts from a child. So we know that there's a halacha called orla, which means for the first three years, of a, of a fruit growing on a tree in Israel, outside of Israel, Terabonon, but inside Israel, it is a requirement, a halachic requirement, a requirement, that we are not permitted to take the fruit of the tree in the first three years. And that's why there's a, one of the reasons, at least, why there's a tradition that we grow a boy's hair for the first three years to represent this concept of, of Orla as well. In the fourth year, the Torah says that the product that grows on the trees has to be koidesh hilulim la Hashem. It has to be holy and it has to be designated to Hashem. So the implication there is that the fourth year of a child's life, the first three years you are exempt from formal education, even though of course we teach children. <coughs> we teach them the stories, we teach them how to say brochas, we teach them how to do certain mitzvahs. But in the fourth year of a child's life, Koidesh Hilulim, that's when we're Hilulim from the word Hallel, we're supposed to teach the child how to actually start saying words of praise to Hashem. In other words, we're supposed to teach them how to read. And then in the fifth year, 
we'd be permitted to eat the fruit in the ordinary fashion. And so that implies that in the fifth year is when you start to wholesale educate the child in learning Mikra, in learning the Tanakh. Okay, so that's what it's teaching us over here. That's when we get to the, to the age of five, which is interesting. It's also interesting that when we speak about education, we speak about five-year increments. So at five years, we start Mikra. At five years after that, you know, at the age of 10, we start Mishnah. Five years after that, at the age of 15, we start the Gemara. Why those in five-year increments? Because we have a principle in Judaism. We actually learn this principle from the Levim. The, tri the tribe of Levi, when they had to be trained in order to be able to serve, to do their jobs, and they had various jobs, they had to transport the pieces of the Mishkan laid on in the base Amikdash, they had to stand guard, and they had to assist the Kohanim, and they had to sing and play instruments during the Avoida. So we're told that if a Levi trains for five years and is unable to do any of the jobs that they were given, then they step back. Because that's the template. The template is if a person tries something for five years and they don't succeed, then they should understand that they're not obviously cut out for this. And that's why when it comes to education, the educational milestones are five-year milestones because that's how long we allow somebody <coughs> to work on a particular st uh, step of education before we expect them to move to the next level of education, which is quite interesting. So five years of immersion in Mikra, in the scriptures, and only after that is a person qualified to be able to start to learn Mishnah, which of course is Torah Shabal Peh, that's now the oral tradition, which expands on the things that we have in the scripture. And after a person has learned five years worth of Mishnah, then, well then what happens is, the person's mind starts to mature. Now, that's another interesting thing about these milestones. It's not a guarantee that the milestones happen on your birthday. You know, a person turns 40 years old, oh, now I suddenly understand the world. Bina, I have great understanding. It's not that simple. The person has to follow the whole program in order to reach the point that by 40, they have that bina, they have that understanding, or by 50, they're in a position to share counsel with other people. But if a person hasn't invested over the first few years, there's no magic wand that happens, you know, on your birthday, happy birthday to you, you know, suddenly you've got this insight. So when a person learns Chumash or Tanakh from the age of five till the age of 10, and then they learn Mishnah from the age of 10 until the age of 15, by the time they get to the age of 15, their mind will have matured to the fact, to, to, the, to the level that they are able to experience Gomorrah. Gomorrah is not a book. I mean, now we refer to the Gomorrah as a series of books. But the meaning of the word Gomorrah is not the encyclopedia of Jewish law. The meaning of the word Gomorrah is a particular methodology of how we are supposed to learn. In fact, the word Gomorrah comes from the word Goimer, which in Hebrew means to complete something, but in Aramaic means to derive something. In other words, you've learned a particular piece of information. And with that insight, with that maturity, and with the knowledge that you have, you can be goimer, you can derive information that would be relevant in another context or in another situation. That's actually what Gomorrah is all about. Gomorrah is the derivation of information from the obvious to the less obvious. So when we say that at the age of 15, a person is now able to learn Gemara, what we're actually saying is that by the age of 15, the person will be in a position that they can start to properly derive information like a Jewish person is supposed to do, assuming, of course, that they've invested the prior 10 years to learning the scriptures and to learning the Mishnah. This is obviously the part for a man, right? So what is the part for a woman? <laughs> good question. That's a really good question. So this is clearly directed at men, no question about it. And the question is, what is, what is the path for women? So let's have a look for a second. When we talk at the beginning about 5, 10, and 15 as being stages of formal Jewish education, we know that the requirement of formal Jewish education for girls is different to formal education for boys. We know that. So for example, there wouldn't be a formal requirement for girls to learn Gomorrah or to learn that methodology which is called Gomorrah. Okay? So the whole concept of a formal education system for girls is a relatively more modern concept that the mission is not going to speak about because there wasn't that expectation. However, when we get to some of the other things like the age of strength, of understanding, of counsel, etc., there doesn't seem to be any reason why this would be different for men or for women. So the, the real question is just about formal education. How does formal education work for girls? 
The short answer to that is it's pretty much the same in today's world. Back then, where it was a really different, uh, you know, subsistence society, it was obviously a really different experience. But the other milestones, I don't believe there's any compelling reason why it would be different for men and for women. Okay, except for maybe 20 Lear Doif, we'll talk about that in a second. According to one interpretation, it would be vastly different for men and for women, and according to another interpretation, it would be identical for men and for women, which we'll get to in just a moment. So we've got these three key stages of how a person is supposed to learn. Let's have a look at Ben Shmoyne Esrei Lechupa. At 18, a person is supposed to get married, which of course sounds very exciting for people who are not yet 18, and sounds very daunting for people who have children who are turning 18. That's where everybody gets really nervous. Oh my, you know, Ben Shmoyne Esrei Lechupa, hang on, they're too young, they're not ready, and so on and so forth. Bear in mind that our society today is not as the society was then. I don't think that it's automatic that in today's world a person should be getting married at 18 because a variety of reasons. First of all, our lifespans are longer. So there was some kind of urgency then that we don't necessarily have now. Second of all, their maturity was undoubtedly beyond the maturity of an average 18-year-old in the 21st century. And not everybody is necessarily ready to get married. And the style, the style of our societies where people go to yeshivas and to seminaries is something clearly in halacha that is good enough reason to defer getting married because a person is entitled to go and study and <coughs> particularly to study Torah. So why 18? Where does the number 18 come from? Why the magical number 18? Chai, exactly. Everybody's going to say chai, right? That's when life begins. Or the more cynical people will say you get 18 years of really just living it up and then you have a responsibility and you've got to get married. You know, you can look at it from either perspective. So here's an interesting thing. From the creation of Adam until the introduction of Chava, which is obviously the moment where Hashem puts Adam to sleep and then he takes a piece of Adam and mutates that into Chava. So from when we're introduced to Adam for the first time, which obviously the Torah had to tell us who we're being introduced to. So that... that time that the Torah says Na ase Adam, let's make a man obviously makes sense that's that's in context any other time that it says the word Adam thereafter you could technically say we don't need that information we know who you're talking about there's only one human being at that point so we know who you're talking about so there are 18 references to the word Adam from after he's introduced until Chava is introduced and quite a number of the commentators say that's how we get a hint in the Torah that it's 18 years until you're supposed to be introduced to your partner just like in, in Adam's case, it wasn't 18 years, but it's 18 representations of who Adam is. So that's how we work out that 18 is the magic number for, for marriage, which is quite interesting. There are those, and uh, I'm not going to get into the anatomy of it, but there are those who talk about the fact that there are 18 ribs. And that's how you get to, to uh, Ben Shmone Esterachupa. But like I say, we'll leave the anatomy to other people. And of course, the big issue of whether or not a rib is even relevant in the story of the creation of Chava. So let's leave that one. The most common is this concept that, it, that refers 18 times to Adam. Now, it's, it's a little bit of a moot point for us because we're not in today's world automatically marrying people off at 18. But it is relevant because there's an halachic component to this as well. And that is when a person reaches the age of 18, they do have to become proactive, or at least whoever's responsible for them, has to become proactive to start thinking about getting married. And if the person is not going to engage in Torah learning for a period of time, then there is an halachic question as to whether or not they can defer getting married. Okay? Because one of the reasons that 18 is the age is because we're told from 18 is when a person starts to have the Yetzirah, the drive to actually want to marry. And if that's not fulfilled, it can create some kind of negative outcome. So it's not so simple. Ask your local Orthodox rabbi what you're supposed to do when your kids hit 18. But it, it, it's just interesting that even in today's world, where we don't automatically get married at 18, it is still a consideration that people have to be aware of it. And I think the ones that are most interesting to us are the next milestones, 20, 30, because these seem to be a little bit more abstract. What are we talking about when we say <coughs> that at the age of 20, a person has to pursue, right? Lir doif. 20 is the age of pursuit. Pursuing what? Well, one opinion is if you're not married by 18, then by 20, you've got to really get moving. So to pursue 
in that context is to pursue a shidduch. Like the Gemara says, the responsibility of marriage lies on the man. So the man is the one who has to be proactive and go out there looking for a shidduch. And the Gemara says that a man is supposed to look for a shidduch with the same enthusiasm that you look for something valuable that you lost. You know, you don't just say, okay, please God in the right time. You know, if you've lost your wallet, nobody says, please God in the right time. You go a little bit more sugar. You start uh, messaging and reaching out and retracing your steps and looking and overturning the furniture. So Liradoif, according to one view, is, well, if 18 comes and goes and a person's not married, now they've got to actually become quite energetic about it and chase who they are going to marry. However, let's be a little bit more optimistic that it wasn't so difficult to find a Shedach. And 18 came and Baruch Hashem and now they married. So now Ben Esrim, by the age of 20, and I was assuming that in those past two years a person got married, Ben Esrim, Lir Doif, now the person has to start chasing a Parnosa because there is a responsibility to look after our family. And that would seem to imply that effectively the first 20 years of a person's life should be dedicated to filling their own cup. In other words, to educating, to learning themselves to engaging to the best of, they can, of their ability to fill themselves with Torah knowledge, which, by the way, would fit with the previous Mishnah we learned. What, what was the previous? That you've got to research and learn and turn it and turn it over until you're very solid in your Torah learning. <coughs> That's the first 20 years. And then after that, then you have license to go out into the world and to actually earn a living. Although, there's another opinion. Lir doif means now you should chase the opportunities to translate all of that theoretical learning into the action, the performance of mitzvahs. Because when a person is engaged in Torah learning as they should in a yeshiva or seminary setting, there are many, many mitzvahs that they don't get to do and are not even supposed to do because you're supposed to be focused on learning. And now you get to go out there and translate many of those uh, ideas that you've learned into mitzvahs that you'll actually fulfill. So Lir Doif could actually be to pursue spiritual opportunities. Bear in mind that in, in, in biblical times, 20 was the age of military conscription. So Lir Doif would mean that that's the time you've got to actually go out there and conquer the world. That's to chase the world and to turn the world into a holy place that it shouldn't just be devoid of any meaning as it tends to be by nature. <coughs> so Lir Doif, you've got to be proactive. Got to go out there, got to make a difference. The so-called military conscription. That is all translating Lir Doif as the onus on the 20-year-old to now take responsibility and go out there and make a difference, chase the world. But there's another possibility as well, and this incidentally would be identical for men and for women. What happens when a person turns 20 from a spiritual perspective? You have to take responsibility. So we've already spoken about taking responsibility, right? For, uh, uh, for? for our various, that's what it is. Up until the age of 20, there is no punishment from on high, even though from the age of 13, a person is already supposed to. Oh, we skipped that, by the way. We didn't say Ben Shloshah Shana Mitzvah. So how did we, we skip that one? Uh, 13 is the age of Bar Mitzvah. I'm going to come back to that in just a second. That's really important. I don't know how I skipped that. My son's Bar Mitzvah this week. I should have thought of that, you know. Ben Shloshah Shana Mitzvahs, right? Uh, 13 is the age of Bar Mitzvah. Okay, we'll come back to it. So, uh, so Ben Esrim Lir Doif means Lir Doif from on high they chase a person because from the age of 20 a person is liable for any punishment that comes from on high. In other words, things like Misabide Shomayim, Kores, like all these heavy things that uh, a person is liable for is only from the age of 20. So they start chasing us from the age of 20 rather than us chasing the world. It's another whole interpretation. Okay, let's go back. Ben Shloish Yisraeli Mitzvahs. How did we skip that? Ben Shloish Yisraeli Mitzvahs. 13 is the age of Bar Mitzvah. Responsibility for taking on mitzvahs. And by the way, that does indicate that this mission is speaking to men because we know that the responsibility for mitzvahs for a woman is from the age of 12. Where do we learn that 13 is the age of commitment to mitzvahs? Anybody know? I'll give you a clue. It was this past Shabbos in the parasha. So where do we learn that 13 is the age where a person has the responsibility of mitzvahs? Anybody know? No? Not Ishmael? Not Asaf? Not Yosef? Okay, we're running out of options. There are only so many people in the parasha, right? 
So this parasha we read about the abduction of Dina. And then we have the story of Shimon and Levi going to rescue their sister and then wiping out the whole of Shem. When the Torah describes it, it says that Shimon and Levi took, right? Vayikach Shimon and Levi, Ish Charboy. Each man took his sword. Now, Ish is a term we only use for a person who has reached maturity. In other words, they're considered an adult halachically. So Shimon and Levi at this point are considered ish, even they were not twins. So most of them, if I should say Levi had just turned 13 and Shimon was kind of at the tail end of his 13th year. <coughs> so, so they took, they took the, these, um, the, their swords and went to attack Shem at the age of 13. You can calculate from Yaakov's story how we know that they were 13 at this particular point in time. So the Torah is therefore telling us Ish, a person has the maturity and the, therefore the responsibility of an adult from the age of 13. Now of all the stories in the whole of the Tanakh that we could have used to teach what a Bar Mitzvah boy is all about, why do you think this is the story? Can you imagine getting up and giving this as a Bar Mitzvah speech? So this kid's just turned 13 and we tell this child, 13, get your sword. That's what happens when you turn 13. You're now a fighting man. You can go out and slaughter a whole city because they kidnapped a Jewish woman, you know? Sure, that could have all kinds of reverberations. So why is this the particular story that we're teaching? Bearing in mind that this is Pirkei Avos, and Pirkei Avos is not just the strict letter of the law. Pirkei Avos is telling us beyond the letter of the law. Maybe it's to actually say that we mustn't. We mustn't be... Um well, if you're going to say that the lesson of the story of being called Ish is when you take your sword, is to teach us not to take your sword, that seems a little bit of the opposite of the story. Because the story uses the word Ish in the same sentence as Ish Charboy, taking this sword. Well, maybe it's a spiritual sword. Then. Okay, it might be a spiritual sword. What's a spiritual sword then? Well, the spiritual sword is like the lion. You must be like the lion that you... You've got that strength to keep Torah and... Okay, so, so what you're suggesting is that at the age of 13, a child, or now an adult, mm -hmm. has to have that strength to be able to stand up to the world, which is not far off. See, what happens over here is this. If you analyze the story of Shimon and Levi, what they did, and we're not going to debate right now whether it was halachically compliant or not, because we know that Yaakov criticized them afterwards. So we're not going to look at whether it fits mm -hmm. in strict halacha. Let's go through what Shimon and Levi are doing. There are two young men, 13 years old, early teenagers, who are effectively now willing to run straight into the fire and attack an entire city of people. You know what we call that? Some people will call it Meshuggah. You know what we call that? We call that Mesiris Nefesh. That people, that what? Of course they were cunning about it. It still was a huge risk. I mean, the fact that they made everybody take a bris means that the people were weakened, but the sheer number of people that they stood up to, they still took a huge risk going into Shechem and attacking the people. So that is what we call Mesiris Nefesh, being willing to sacrifice for the things that we believe in. And that's why we say Ben Shmona Esrei, uh, sorry, Ben Shlosh Esrei La Mitzvah, at 13 is the age of mitzvahs. We want a child to know that as you become an adult, and now you commit yourself to doing mitzvahs, it should not be a commitment that makes sense if and when, if it suits me, when I'm in the right mood, when the stars align, then I'll do mitzvahs. The message is that it should be with mysterious nefesh. I'm going to be willing to do what the Torah expects of me, even when it is incredibly difficult, and even, <coughs> excuse me, even if I stand <coughs> potentially to lose. All right, I mean, it doesn't have to be as radical as losing one's life, as they did. Could be losing all kinds of things. And that's something that unfortunately we don't always remember to inculcate in our children, that when you reach that age of responsibility to become a Jewish person, it's not in a comfort zone. It's that Judaism is going to expect things that are uncomfortable. Judaism is going to expect things that come at a cost. Judaism is going to expect us to do things that are not easy for us to do. That is Judaism. That's what mitzvahs mean. And therefore, the link between the age of mitzvahs and the story of Shimon and Levi is to consolidate that thought into the, our kids, into our children's minds. When you dedicate yourself to do mitzvahs, be prepared that there will be times you have to take great risks and times you have to do things that are really uncomfortable in order to fulfill a mitzvah. Okay, 
So I haven't gone back to 13. Correct. They're the ones who said that, right? So such a thing shouldn't be done. So, okay, so that's 13. Now let's jump back. So we said 20. 20 is about going out there and about chasing and about making a difference to the world. What's 30? Ben Shloshim Lekoyach. 30 is the age <coughs> of strength. Why is it the age of strength? Because going back to the Levium, remember they had to train for five years. And by the age of 30, that's when they started the heavy lifting, literally the heavy lifting, because it was their job to dismantle the Mishkan and to load everything up onto the wagons that would then transport it to the next place. When they got to the next place, it was their job to take everything down and to build the Mishkan. In other words, they actually had to physically do heavy labor. And where, what age were they when they started this particular job? The age of 30. That's how we derive in Shloshim Lekoyach, that the age of 30 is when a person reaches peak strength. I believe that there's even biology to support this because a certain part of the genetic makeup of a human being actually causes the human body to improve in their first three decades of life. That's why, for example, you look from a baby until a fully grown adult, there's a lot of development, there's a lot of growth. But somewhere in one's 30s, that genetic process stops. So when we say over the hill, it's actually not a joke. And uh, you know, you then kind of plateau for a bit and then the body goes into biological decline. So it's not far off when it says, What's the lesson for us? The lesson is that if you have a look at it, let's say a person does get married at the age of 18. By the time a person is 30, and I think it's even fair to say in today's world, a person's 30s, could actually be the most difficult decade of a person's life because that's when you're dealing with so many issues in terms of child rearing, right? In a person's 30s, that's when you have little children and the beginning of teenagers. That's often where people have their, their greatest expenses because now there's all the chinuch expenses and there's the, you know, you start to see on the horizon the tertiary chinuch expenses and potentially, potentially the shidduch expenses. So the, the, the 30s could be a time where a person can feel very overwhelmed and as a result of feeling overwhelmed can be quite distracted from the Yiddishkeit. So Ben Shloshim Lekoyach has a very important lesson for us that during a person's 30s, from the age of 30, you have to have Koyach. You've got to kind of garner up some strength that perhaps you didn't need before to stay the course and to be confident that it's not forever and there'll be a time where things settle down but in the meantime you need all of that koyach to be on top of kids and to be on top of finances and to be on top of all the various things that come into life at that particular point in time whereas when a person gets to 40 that doesn't all disappear let's be honest a person if, if the 30s are hectic the 40s are pretty hectic too the, the value of the 40s is we now have a lot of life experience and with life experience we start to have insight into the world that we didn't necessarily have before and that's what Bina means Bina is understanding that is the result of research it's the result of, of experience <coughs> as opposed to Chochmah which is just ideas that we encounter for the first time Bina is the collation of all kinds of information all kinds of processing that we've done in the past that helps us to get the clarity that we need we also know that Moshe Rabbeinu turns to the Jewish people just before he passes away in Parashas Kisavoy and he says to them that you have been in the desert now for 40 years Hashem has not yet given you a knowing heart and eyes that see and ears that can hear Ad hayoyim hazeh until this day. The Gemara learns from this that it takes 40 years for a person to master what their teacher is trying to teach them. Because the Jews had been with Moshe as their teacher for 40 years and now they had that insight. Now they were starting to get a handle on it. Now they were starting to grasp it. So the same principle. If at five years old a person starts learning, then Ben Arboim, when they get to their 40s, they'll actually start to understand the things that they began to learn before. So it's not a magic wand that just because a person turns 40, they automatically have insight. It's if a person has been learning consistently, then by the time they get to 40, they actually start to understand what they're learning. This is where it comes from when you hear people telling you that you may not learn Kabbalah until you're 40 years old. It's not because 40 years old they open the club and now you can join. It's because if a person has been learning consistently from the age of five and they've been developing according to this course, then by the age of 40 you'll have the insight and the information, the, the, the understanding to learn Kabbalah without learning the wrong insights from Kabbalah. So, five, 10, 13, 15, and even 18, you're effectively talking about the responsibility of a parent. 
The parent has to educate the child. The parent has to take a child into the age of responsibility for mitzvahs. And the parent has to help the child to find a shidduch. 20, 30, and 40 is effectively talking about the person's own development, going out there, making a difference to the world, having the strength to be able to deal with life's challenges and having the insight to now know that we can learn things with a depth that we didn't have before. But 50 is actually a message to other people. Ben Chamishim Le'etza is not a suggestion that the day a person turns 50, they should put up a sign on their door that says, counselor, you know, like the Peanuts comics, you know, the doctor is in. You, it means that if you're looking for somebody to advise you, you should be looking for somebody who is at least 50 years old because they'll have that life experience and they probably will also be a little bit more settled. You know, young people can be quite impetuous sons and, you know, very uh, easily heated up. Whereas a person from the age of 50 and on will be able to be balanced, they'll be able to be objective, and they'll be able to give us advice. So the Mishnah is not here addressing the 50 year old, it's addressing the rest of the community. The great example of failure in this regard is the infamous story of Rechavam. Rechavam was Shlomo HaMelech's son and heir. At that time there was a prophecy, the prophecy said that the kingdom would split. But unfortunately, Rechavam was a great reason why the kingdom split because the Tanakh tells us that he chose advisors who were young and inexperienced. And because of that, they gave him poor advice. They advised him <coughs> not to forgive. They advised him to dig his heels in on issues that he shouldn't have. And as a direct result of that, the kingdom was split in two. And therefore, we learn that when a person is seeking Eitzah, Go to people who are settled, people who have experience, people who have some years under their belt. The age of 60 is the age of Zikna. Now, let's be honest. Do you think it would go down well if we said to somebody on their 60th birthday, congratulations on reaching old age? Can you imagine saying that? Especially in today's world where, of course, we know that 60 is the new 40. And it's, it's, it's like, what's the, what exactly is it saying over here? That 60 is Zikna. Now it's interesting because there's a Pasuk in Eov that speaks about a person, God forbid, going to the grave. And the word that it uses over there for grave, which is a very unusual word, has the gematria value of 60. Great. Isn't that a wonderful reason to say that 60 is the age of old age because it's associated with going to, to the grave. You know, it doesn't sound very attractive. So one of the things that we know is that the Gemara tells us the word Zokain, Zokain, which translates as old, is actually an acronym for Ze Kona Chochma. That this is somebody who has acquired wisdom. And that's what we mean when we say Zokain. Not that somebody is biologically old, but rather that this is somebody who has accumulated a tremendous amount of wisdom. And that's the message of Yehav Ben Shishim Lezikna. That's why the word is sagacity. Because in addition to the, to the fact that by 40 you already have insight. And by 50 you're in a position to be able to share knowledge with other people. But by 60, 60 a person has true wisdom. And therefore, therefore what? What does the Torah tell us? That there's a requirement to show respect to somebody who is old. Who is old? From 60. So all of the halachic requirements, standing up, offering your seat, various things that you're supposed to do for a person who's old, applies from the age of 60. Ze, the Zion stands for Zeh, and the Kufnun stands for Kona, to acquire. Ze Kona Chochma. This is somebody who has acquired wisdom. The Chochma, you've got to have the Chochma to know that it's there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It's not actually in the word, interestingly enough. It, yeah, it's interesting. Interesting, it's not in the word. How do we know that 70 is old age? Because it says David HaMelech became old. We actually just read it in the Aftar a couple of weeks ago. David HaMelech became old. How old was he at the time? He was 70 years old. We also know that the Torah tells us that 70 70 is the, the so-called normal lifespan and therefore it's considered ripe old age. If a person had the schus to be able to live to 70, it's ripe old age. We also know that Kores Kores is that a person dies before the age of 60. Therefore, if a person lives through the age of 60, we say, Zokain, that person has got old age. They didn't die prematurely. And if they then live to 70, three score and 10, right? Then we say, Seva, that is ripe old age. They've really done very well. Now, one of the most beautiful talks 
that uh, you can actually listen to it, it's recorded, was the speech that the Rebbe made, the Babacha Rebbe made on his 70th birthday, saying that in American culture, by the age of 70, there's an expectation that you have to retire. You know, by 65, you should have, and by 70, you definitely have to. And he said that that's antithetical to Judaism. <coughs> First of all, because by the age of 70, you have knowledge and wisdom and life experience that is invaluable to everybody else. So the Rebbe suggested that people when they get to the age of 70 should all be re-employed in the corporate world in an advisory capacity because what they have to offer the world is incredible and nobody's valuing it enough. And then he said that when you complete 70 years you now enter the next decade which is the decade of 80 and there the Torah says clearly that if a person heads towards the age of 80 or as it says over here if a person gets to the age of 80 that means that Hashem has given them unusual fortitude unusual strength therefore the lesson is that when a person turns 80 their commitment to their Yiddishkeit should not slow down they shouldn't then hide behind the fact that they are older and therefore may be excused from engagement. Ligvura, 80 is the age of now being strongest in your Yiddishkeit, strongest in your learning, strongest in your commitment. How's that for a thought? Right? It's not a time to say, you know, the so-called uh, dusk of, of life or, or something like that. 90, it says, Lashuach, a person begins to bend over but quite a number of the commentaries say you should read it losuach which comes from the word sicha to speak because at 90 a person may have physical weakness and therefore their greatest contribution is going to be by the things they teach and the things that they say even if they can't necessarily do as much as they used to do so rather than thinking of oh this poor stooped over person who's now you know 90 years old understand that this is somebody we should be listening to because they have so much to share and to offer to the world you could say that too, and see it in any other mafroshim. But yeah, the word suah, la suah is, uh, is is related to davening as well. Let's talk briefly about the number one hundred because it is fascinating. And I did ask you the question at the beginning: why stop at hundred and not go beyond? We do know that a hundred is a significant age in whose life? Who had a major thing happen in their life? Avraham Avinu's life, right? Avraham Avinu's life at a hundred years old. That's when Yitzchak is born. It's a major thing in his life. That's the continuity. That is the Kibbe Yitzchak Yikore Lechazora. This is what's going to keep Judaism alive. One year prior to that, he's 99 years old. And Hashem appears to him. There's a beautiful story that the, the fifth Rebbe of Chabad, when he was a young boy, he was turning five, came to see his grandfather, who was the Rebbe at the time, and he was crying. So his grandfather said to him, why are you crying? He said, what do you mean? I read the parasha this week and in the parasha it says that Hashem appeared to Avraham. Why has he never appeared to me? That's why he was crying. So his grandfather said to him, you have to realize that when a Jew who is a tzaddik at the age of 99 chooses to take such a radical step as to have a bris, then he deserves that Hashem should appear to him. And the message over here is that 99 you know, if you get 99% on a test, it's pretty good, right? 99, as great as it is, is not yet 100. Because 100 is the number of perfection. And the gap between 99 and 100 could be so radical that a person has to do something as dramatic as having a bris. But when you get to 100, that's where Hashem appears. In other words, 100 is not a biological age. 100 is a sign of mastery. We're told that the neshama has 10 facets to it. Each of those 10 facets has 10 facets to it. So to reach a hundred means that a person has mastered everything about their personality, everything about their neshama. Such a person is ki'ilu meis. It's as if they are no longer alive. What do you mean they're as if they're no longer alive? Well, we know that when Moshe says to Hashem that he wants to see Hashem's face, Hashem says to him, ki'loi yir'ani ha'adam v'chai. No person can see me while they are alive. So ki'ilu meis, the fact that somebody is as if they are dead, means they no longer have that restriction of a normal human experience where you can't experience Hashem, where you can't see God. That is removed. Ke'ilumais, it doesn't say that he's as good as dead. Ke'ilumais, it's as if the person has left the constraints of this world. Ve'ovar u'batel mina o'ilam, this is somebody who is no longer held by the world. O'ilam is related to the word helem, 
concealment of Hashem. So when a person reaches a hundred, not a hundred on the calendar, but a hundred in terms of mastery, then they are no longer stuck in the helem, in the concealment of this world, and they can actually experience godliness in a revealed way, even while they are alive. The fact that that is the possible interpretation of a hundred will solve a big issue. This is the end of the chapter. We have an axiom in Judaism which says, Messiahim betoiv, you always have to end on a positive note. If you take it at face value that a hundred means that the person is as if they're dead and they're no longer part of this world, that sounds like a very negative way to end the peric. But when we understand what a hundred means, that it's a spiritual achievement, and to be so-called like dead and no longer part of the world is a huge spiritual release, then we see that this chapter actually does, like any other part of Judaism, end on a positive note. So, please God, we should all make it to a hundred and beyond, both biologically and spiritually. Amen. Amen.